This is the third lecture video for my module on mitosis and meiosis. So the first lecture video is on chromosomes and the cell cycle. The second lecture video is on mitosis, and this video will cover meiosis. So the topics that we're going to cover are the uh, function of meiosis, the different stages that occur during this process, we're going to compare mitosis and meiosis and then discuss problems that can arise with meiosis. So for the first section, I will discuss the function of meiosis. You need to know what gametes are. Um, you need to be able to explain the difference between a haploid and a diploid cell. And finally, you need to be able to explain the difference between homologous chromosomes and sister chromatids. And yes, we've gone over that topic before, but I want to make sure that you understand it. So here we have the human life cycle. So first of all, notice in the lower left-hand corner is a definition or sentence about the function of meiosis. So meiosis is essential for sexual reproduction because it produces gametes, which are egg and sperm. Now the other purpose of meiosis is genetic recombination. And we will talk about what that is in like the next few slides. So let's take a look at the human life cycle. So here we have mom and dad. Now meiosis occurs only in your sex cells. And you can also, they are also called like germ cells. The rest of your cells are somatic cells. They are just like your regular body cells. So I'm gonna write that down for you here. There we go. I was having some cursor issues there. Okay, so a somatic cell is like a regular body cell. X or germ cell undergoes meiosis to produce gametes. That is cell division um, in your sex cells. Hold on. There we go. Okay. I'm going to move this so you can see it here. There we go. Okay, so somatic cells are like your regular body cells, germ cells, or sex cells undergo meiosis to produce your gametes. So in women, meiosis occurs in the ovaries. In men, it occurs in the testes. And remember that gametes are essential for sexual reproduction. So here we have mom and dad. Meiosis occurs. Egg and sperm are produced. So here we are. Egg and sperm come together through fertilization. They produce a zygote. And then zygote adds cells, adds many cells, becomes a baby. Cells are added as the baby grows, becomes an adolescent, then an adult. Then meiosis occurs to produce the gametes. So let's go on to the next slide, which is looking at haploid versus diploid cells. So the gametes are haploid. And you'll notice my definition here over on the left side. So haploid is symbolized by the letter N. And a haploid cell is one with a single set of chromosomes, and I'll explain what that means in just a second. So I always think of haploid half. So it is half of the genetic information 
that you would find in like a regular cell. A diploid cell right here is symbolized by 2N. If you think about di, the first part of diploid, di means two. So for my definition, I put a full set of chromosomes, which also means homologous chromosomes. So now in humans, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes, and we discussed this in mitosis. So 22 pairs of your chromosomes are what we call autosomes. Now, autosomes code for just like your regular body characteristics. So autosomes code for standard body characteristics. And then humans have 22 pairs of autosomes. Now, when I say a pair, I mean homologous chromosomes. You receive one from mom, one from dad. And my next slide, I know I've shown it to you before, but it's looking at homologous versus sister chromatids, okay? Now, 22 pairs of your chromosomes are autosomes, one pair are your sex chromosomes. So it determines gender and it is one pair of chromosomes in humans, okay? Now, let's take a look at diploid versus haploid. So with a diploid cell, you have two homologous chromosomes per pair. Okay, so if you look at this picture, we have two homologous chromosomes for pink, two homologous for purple, two for yellow. That would be three pairs of chromosomes. Each have two homologous chromosomes in the pair. That is diploid. Di means two, two chromosomes per pair. Now haploid, on the other hand, only has one chromosome to represent each pair. So it has half the genetic information. Okay, and this makes sense if you think about it. So if you have a sperm that is haploid, right, it has one chromosome per pair and an egg that is haploid and they come together in fertilization that restores the diploid state of the cell. Now, when I was showing you mitosis, I would draw a pair, like chromosome pair number one. One of those chromosomes comes from mom, one of those comes from your dad, and they are homologous. And this shows you, right? One of the chromosomes is carried in the sperm, one is carried in the egg. So let's revisit homologous versus sister chromatids. I'm going to write these definitions for you. So I want you to take a second and think about whether homologous chromosomes are identical. So they are not identical. Okay, they code for the same genes, but they can have different versions of the gene. Now remember we call these different versions alleles. Okay. So homologous chromosomes are not identical. One comes from mom, one comes from dad. Now they both code for say eye color, but maybe mom has the version for brown eyes, dad has the version for blue eyes. Now sister chromatids, and you should remember this from mitosis. So if you do not remember it, I recommend that you go back to that lecture. So, 
sister chromatids are identical. Remember, mom's chromosome made an exact copy. Dad's chromosome made an exact copy. Okay, now sister chromatids only occur after DNA replication. Now, take a second and try to remember at which part of the cell cycle do you get DNA replication? So the cell cycle includes G1, S, G2, and M phase. Now remember G1, S, and G2 are collectively called interphase. Now S phase, which is part of interphase, I always think of S synthesis, right? DNA synthesis. It's also called DNA replication or DNA duplication. All the same thing. Now, S phase is in preparation for cell division, but it is not considered part of mitosis or meiosis. It goes G1, S with DNA replication, G2, then M, which stands for mitosis or meiosis, depending on what kind of cell you're looking at. Okay, so homologous chromosomes are not identical. Sister chromatids are identical. Now, if you see this X formation, like I have in the picture here, then it is um, it is sister chromatids that you are looking at. Remember, they are attached in the middle by the centromere. Now, the other thing I want you to notice in this image is it says homologous chromosomes on the right. Now, what this means is that the two purple sister chromatids are homologous to the two green sister chromatids, okay? Now, if you, like when you read your textbook or watch videos to learn more about meiosis, you will see that two sister chromatids are called one chromosome. So even though you see four strands here, it's still considered two chromosomes with each chromosome containing two sister chromatids. So I don't make that distinction a lot, like in quizzes and things like that, but you do need to remember that for when you read about meiosis. Okay, so now we are going to go into the stages of meiosis. You need to be able to tell me how many daughter cells are produced and whether they are genetically identical. Now, on my screen here, I accidentally wrote that twice, right? One and three are the same. Now two, I want you to be able to explain what occurs during each stage of meiosis. And then finally, you need to be able to identify whether meiosis one or meiosis two is most similar to mitosis. Now at this point, you're probably thinking, what is meiosis one, meiosis two? But we're going to get into that. So here is an image of meiosis one. Okay, but right now I'm going to jump over to the whiteboard to explain some of these stages and then we will go back to the slide. So let's start with some general information about meiosis. So this is kind of like the overview. Okay, so a diploid parent cell, right? That's like your original sex cell, undergoes meiosis to produce four genet uh, haploid, I'm gonna write that, four haploid genetically unique, right? They are not identical. So four haploid genetically unique daughter cells. Okay, start with one parent cell and it has the full set of chromosomes. Meiosis occurs, now you have four 
daughter cells, but they are haploid and they are genetically unique. And that is because of genetic recombination, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. So the daughter cells are gametes, egg and sperm. Now, another thing that you need to remember about meiosis is that it undergoes two rounds of cell division. And we call those meiosis one and meiosis two. The parent cell undergoes two rounds of cell division, meiosis one and meiosis two. Now, during each round of cell division, you have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. I'm going to draw a picture here that is an overview of the entire process. So we are starting with the diploid parent cell, but this is after S phase of the cell cycle. So you will see sister chromatids. All right, so I'm gonna explain this in just a minute. I forget my drawings done here. Oh, running out of room. Let's see. make my daughter cells smaller. Now, the daughter cells are not actually smaller than the parent cell. I'm just running out of room here. Okay. All right, so here we have diploid parent cell. and then two daughter cells that occur after meiosis one. Now each of those cells will divide to give you four daughter cells, four haploid daughter cells. And do not worry about whether the two daughter cells are haploid or diploid. Gets a little confusing when we talk about that. Okay, so here we have meiosis one. So your parent cell has gone through division, cytokinesis, and split into two daughter cells. And here we have meiosis two. So each of the daughter cells from the original cell division, they go through cytokinesis and you get four daughter cells. Now let's look at what happens to the chromosomes during all of this. Okay, so I'm showing you what would be like chromosome pair number one, and each homologous chromosome has two sister chromatids. Okay, so that's why I say this cell has gone through S phase, DNA synthesis or replication. So now after meiosis one, the red sister chromatids will be in one daughter cell and the blue sister chromatids will be in the other daughter cell. So they have actually been separated. This is the separation of 
homologous chromosomes. So that's what occurs during meiosis one. Now we go through meiosis two. And here we have a single chromosome in each cell. Okay, so this is why the daughter cells are haploid, have the genetic information. Okay, so if you think about the diploid parent cell prior to S phase, it had one long red, one long blue. S phase occurs, you have sister chromatids for each. Meiosis one, those homologous chromosomes are separated, each one with sister chromatids. Meiosis two, the sister chromatids are separated and you end up with four haploid daughter cells. So I'm gonna write that here. So in meiosis one, I'm gonna make my font a little smaller here so I have room. Homologous chromosomes separated. Now it's going to be really important that you remember this distinction between meiosis one and meiosis two. So meiosis two, sister chromatids are separated. And that is how you end up with haploid gametes. So now I'm going to go into the actual stages of meiosis. So we are looking at prophase one. Now, since there are two rounds of cell division, you have to say prophase one or prophase two to indicate which round you are talking about. There are different things that occur depending on which round of cell division you are looking at. So I'm going to write down what occurs during prophase one and then we will discuss it. So just as with mitosis, the nuclear membrane breaks down. So there is no nucleus during the process of meiosis. Remember this could also be called the nuclear envelope. So the chromosomes, and I'm gonna write each with two sister chromatids, to remind you, to the chromosomes supercoil. So I want you to think back on that slide that I showed you with chromatin. It's DNA wound around histones, which are proteins. But with chromatin, it's very loosely wound around these proteins. So it looks kind of like that massive spaghetti. Now, supercoil means that the DNA wraps tighter and more times around those histones. So when the chromosomes are supercoiled, they are very dense. And that is when they take on that X formation. Remember, prophase, like the whole process of meiosis, occurs after DNA replication. Now, what we call the meiotic spindle forms. In mitosis, it was called the mitotic spindle. Here it's called the meiotic spindle. Same thing, though. But what I want you to remember is those spindle fibers are made of microtubules. Microtubules are fibers in the cytoskeleton, right? The cytoskeleton has three different types of fibers, microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. Now, this next part is really important. Crossing over occurs. And this is the first point at which you get genetic recombination during meiosis. So genetic recombination. So now we are going to talk about genetic recombination. So I'm gonna define it for you first. So 
phylogenetic recombination involves the exchange of alleles between homologous chromosomes leads to novel or new combinations of alleles. Now keep in mind, alleles are versions of the same gene. So it's not like you're exchanging an eye color gene for a hair color gene. What this means is that these homologous chromosomes could swap the um, blue eye version of eye color gene with the brown eye version of the eye color gene. So I'm going to attempt to draw a picture here that illustrates this. Okay. So we have, I'm going to show you two pairs of chromosomes here. The first pair, the long ones, would be pair number one. Okay. Now, these homologous chromosomes, each with two sister chromatids, are going to line up next to each other so that they can exchange alleles. Now I'm going to draw a small chromosome here. Let's say this is chromosome pair number two. So the ones I'm drawing here are homologous, right? There are two sister chromatids but the two sets of sister chromatids are homologous. So let's see here if I can draw this. So what I'm drawing here, I'm trying to show you like a close up of what happens with crossing over. Let's move my Oh, that didn't work. Then I have to move everything, so. Okay. So these two X's I drew here are chromosome pair number one. The reds are homologous to the blues. Now let's use the same examples that I did with mitosis, but I'm gonna add a little information. So here we have the eye color gene, right? But now I'm going to add a hair color gene. Now keep in mind, eye color, hair color, height, skin color it is not this simple. But for the sake of my examples, we will say that it is. Here's the eye color gene on the homologous chromosome, hair color gene down here. Okay, now, let's say the red sister chromatids are the chromosome you inherited from your mother, the blues are the chromosome you inherited from your dad. So here we have mom, and she has brown eyes. I'm gonna make my font smaller. So mom has the allele for brown eyes. And she also has the allele for blonde hair. Okay. We're going to write blonde hair over here. Now remember, these are identical sister chromatids, right? So with these, like the chromosome from mom, I think about it as not being sister chromatids, but before DNA replication, mom donated a chromosome to her offspring that coded for brown eyes along with blonde hair. Okay, now dad, I think I gave dad blue eyes 
in my previous examples. We're actually going to move that over here. So let's give dad red hair. Okay. Now remember, these are identical. So we're doing red hair here. Okay, now I said that genetic recombination makes new combinations of alleles. Now crossing over is where this occurs. So crossing over the homologous chromosomes, and you will also see them called non-sister chromatids, swap alleles. So mom originally had the brown eye allele, but one of those sister chromatids swapped with the other homologous chromosome. So now we have blue eyes on one of these sister chromatids, okay? Now, if this seems like super confusing, which a lot of times it does, I would urge you to watch the amoeba sister video or something like that so you get a better visualization of what crossing over is. So now over here, we have brown eyes. fix that here. Okay. All right. So the blue eye allele swapped with that brown eye allele. So what I want you to notice here is that this sister chromatid, this long red sister chromatid, now has a different combination of alleles. Now, it has blue eyes mixed with blonde hair. Now that is different from the chromosomes donated by mom or dad, right? Mom's original chromosome had brown eyes, blonde hair, okay? Dad's original chromosome had blue eyes, red hair. But now we have a chromosome or sister chromatid at this point with blue eyes, blonde hair. So that's different. Yeah, it looks like I wrote those in the wrong color, but that's okay. And now dad's sister chromatid has brown eyes, red hair, instead of the original blue eyes, red hair. So hopefully that makes sense. So there's new allele combinations. Okay, so that would be like blue eyes, blonde hair is new. Brown eyes, red hair, new. Okay. So crossing over, you have to have homologous chromosomes for crossing over to occur. And we will discuss that more in just a minute. So now we are going to go into metaphase one. Okay. So remember metaphase middle. So homologous chromosomes line up on either side of the metaphase plate. Now remember the metaphase, metaphase plate, it's imaginary, but it indicates the middle of the cell. So I'm gonna write middle of cell. So metaphase middle. 
Now, metaphase one is the second point in this whole process at which you get genetic recombination. And this occurs through what we call independent assortment of homologous chromosomes. Okay, so genetic recombination. Okay. Draw this for you. So here we have our parent cell. I'm going to draw another cell here. Now, keep in mind that there's only one cell at this point, but I want to show you a couple examples of independent assortment. So here is my metaphase plate. And I'll draw my metaphase plate over here. It doesn't actually look like this in the cell. Now, keep in mind that during cytokinesis, telophase cytokinesis, the cell is squeezed in half at the metaphase plate, meaning that above the metaphase plate, you will have a new daughter cell below the metaphase plate will be the other daughter cell. Let's take a look at what our chromosomes look like during metaphase one. Now remember I'm showing you two pairs of chromosomes, pair number one, pair number two. And that the, whoops, the two long red chromosome or sister chromatids are homologous to the two long blue sister chromatids. Okay, now I said homologous chromosomes line up on either side of the metaphase plate. So notice here that the red sister chromatids are homologous to the blue sister chromatids right here. And one set is above the metaphase plate, one set is below. And the same with chromosome pair number two. Now in humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? So as the cell is going through metaphase one, you would see 23 different pairs here, right? Each pair has homologous chromosomes, each chromosome with two sister chromatids. Now, here is what independent assortment means. So let's draw our red long sister chromatids there and our short red sister chromatids there. Okay, so this is different than the other cell because we have for chromosome pair number one, we have the red sister chromatids on top. Those would be the sister chromatids from mom's chromosome. We have the blue sister chromatids from chromosome pair number one on the bottom. Okay, these are sister chromatids that came from dad's chromosome, right? Now here is the difference. Instead of the short red sister chromatids on the top, we have short blue. Okay, so what this means is the daughter cell that is produced from the first cell I drew here is going to have long reds, short reds. The daughter cell that comes from the lower half of this cell will have long blue, short blue. But look at the second combination here. The daughter cell from the cell on the right would have long red, short blue. 
your daughter shell from this parent shell here would have a long blue, short red. Okay, so it's totally random as to how these line up on either side of the metaphase plate. Now you have to have longs and shorts on, you know, for each side, but whether it is the long sister chromatids from mom or the long sister chromatids from dad on top is totally random. So let's go back to the PowerPoint for a second because I have some slides that show this. Okay, here is crossing over. The first point at which you get genetic recombination is prophase one through crossing over. So in this picture, it shows you homologous chromosomes. Each chromosome has two sister chromatids. Crossing over has to occur between homologous chromosomes because they are exchanging alleles. It would do no good for the sister chromatids to exchange alleles, right? Because they're identical. Why would you exchange a blue eye allele for a blue eye allele? That's kind of a waste of energy for the cell and that would not create novel allele combinations. The blue eye allele has to be swapped with like the brown eye allele. That creates novel allele combinations. So if you look at the picture here, I lost my cursor. Nope, still gone. There we go. Okay, so if you look at the picture here, now those green sister chromatids have a little section of red. That's to show you that the allele switched places. It was an exchange of genetic information. The same is true for the red sister chromatids. They have a little bit of green on them now. So that's the equivalent of swapping the blue eye allele for the brown eye allele. So my next slide is independent assortment of homologous chromosomes occurs during metaphase one. So let's look at these two possibilities, okay? This is pretty much the same picture I drew for you on the whiteboard. Now remember that cytokinesis or squeezing that cell in half occurs along the metaphase plate. So I'm gonna draw a metaphase plate. It would go right down the middle there. So after metaphase one, meiosis one, you have two daughter cells. Now, in possibility one, the long blues lined up with the short blues. The long reds lined up with the short reds. So after metaphase one, I do not know why I keep losing my cursor here. Nope. Know that it's somewhere on my screen, but I do not know where. Oh. I apologize for this delay here. Why won't it come back? Oh, there we go. I think I got it back. And now I have all these red marks on my screen, but okay. So we were looking at possibility one. So after meiosis one, when that cell gets squeezed in half, you end up with a daughter cell that has long blue, like long blue sister chromatids, short blue sister chromatids. Now after meiosis two, when that cell divides in half, you end up with a long blue, short blue, long blue, short blue. The same happens with the other daughter cell that is long red, short red. You end up with gametes that have long red, short red, long red, short red, okay? 
But now let's look at possibility two. Here, I'm going to draw the metaphase plate. We'll go right down here. So that's where the cell divides. Now they lined up differently for this possibility. So the daughter cells after meiosis one have long blue sister chromatids, short red sister chromatid. The other daughter cell has long red, short blue. So your gametes are different, okay? Combination three has long blue, short red. Combination four has long red, short blue. So if you picture these gametes as say sperm, they are going to carry different information. Now they carry all of the chromosomes, one from each pair, but they're haploid. They have half the genetic information. So one of those gametes would have like the chromosome that came from dad. One of those gametes would have the chromosome that came from mom. Okay, so that is why you can have multiple children and they all look different because your gametes are all different. They have different combinations of alleles. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to the whiteboard. And we looked at prophase one. That is when crossing over occurs between homologous chromosomes. And that is genetic recombination. We have metaphase one. You also get genetic recombination through the independent assortment of homologous chromosomes. And that means around the metaphase plate. Now we are going to look at anaphase one. So we already got past the two most, what I would think are confusing parts of meiosis, which would be prophase one and metaphase one. So anaphase one is very similar to what you learned in mitosis. I always think of anaphase away because the chromosomes are being separated to opposite poles of the cell. But here's a key point. It is homologous chromosomes are separated and pulled toward opposite poles of the cell. Now this is gonna be different from anaphase two. Draw my cell. Here is my long chromosome. Now I'm drawing it in a little, it looks a little different because I wanna show you that it is being pulled towards the pole. So it kind of bends that way, right? And then let's put our short red over here. There we go. I'm actually gonna draw the spindle fibers Usually I don't draw them, but I like to remind you during anaphage that it is the shortening of the spindle fibers or microtubules that pull the chromosomes to opposite sides. So now let's draw our blue chromosomes. Now, notice that there are long chromosomes, like long sister chromatids and short sister chromatids going to each pole. So the daughter cells have to have chromosomes from each pair, 23 pairs for humans, right? You can't leave out a chromosome that codes for say height because then the resulting person has no chromosome for height, right? They would have no gene for height. So you have to have a representation of each of the 23 pairs. Let me draw my spindle fiber. 
And I apologize about the length of this video, but I don't really know how to do meiosis any faster. Okay, so notice here that homologous chromosomes are separated. The long reds are homologous to the long blues, and they're being separated and pulled towards opposite poles of the cell. So now let's look at I'm going to lump telophase and cytokinesis in together. And if you were reading your textbook or anything, that's what most all of the um, sources of information will do. So we have telophase one and cytokinesis. So during telophase one, is pretty similar to mitosis. The nuclear membranes reform around each set of chromosomes at opposite poles of the cell. Okay, so the nuclei reform. Um, the microfilament and to squeeze the cell in half, forming the cleavage furrow. That just means like, if you looked at the pictures before, it's kind of squeezing it in half and making that indention in the middle, that is the cleavage furrow. Now, this is technically telophase one. Now, cytokinesis occurs, dividing the cells in half. Actually, I should say dividing the cell in half, forming two daughter cells. So I'm gonna draw telophase here and then cytokinesis. Now, we still have sister chromatids at this point, right? Red sister chromatids here, blue sister chromatids on the other part of the cell at the opposite pole. Now, it could have just as easily been long red, short blue on the top, long blue, short red on the bottom. Remember, independent assortment says you can have all different combinations of sister chromatids. So nuclei reform, especially with the blue. Nucleus reforms, nucleus reforms, now, at this point, there would be a cleavage, a cleavage furrow, but I can't draw it on the whiteboard. So now we have cytokinesis. Which is the actual division of the cell. And we end up with two daughter cells. And that is the end of meiosis one. So here we have there is a nucleus, but I'm not going to draw it in the interest of time. So one of your daughter cells has sister chromatids from mom for chromosome pair one. Sister chromatids from mom for chromosome pair two. Same down here. Only the sister chromatids are the ones that you received from your dad. Okay. So at the end of meiosis one, you have two daughter cells, but they do not have homologous chromosomes, right? They have one chromosome with two sister chromatids that belongs to pair number one.
Okay, but the long blues are in the other daughter cell. So now we're going to go through meiosis two. Actually, let me write prophase two. Okay. So now I'm going to draw two daughter cells because that is what you got after meiosis one. Okay, so we have this daughter cell, we have this daughter cell. And then I'm going to write down what occurs during prophase two, right after I draw this. So I want you to remember that meiosis two is very similar to mitosis. Okay, everything that occurs in meiosis two occurs with sister chromatids. Everything that occurred during meiosis one involved homologous chromosomes. Okay, so during, whoops, during prophase two, the nuclear, membrane breaks down again. Meiotic spindle has to form again. Okay. And the chromosome supercoil. So it's kind of like after meiosis one, everything went back to normal. And now in meiosis two, it's got to start over again, but there are different contents in the cell. Okay, so that is prophase two. The other thing you need to know is between prophase and metaphase, those microtubules attach to the sister chromatids. And that occurred in prophase one as well. I just, I don't think I wrote it. Okay, so now we are on metaphase two. So notice already prophase two is a lot uh, more straightforward than prophase one. Oh, something I forgot to mention actually. So take a look at this picture in prophase two. Crossing over does not occur in prophase two. So why do you think that is? What's missing in these cells that were present in the prophase one cell? So let's go back and take a look at prophase one. Notice that for crossing over to occur, you have to have homologous chromosomes. The long reds are homologous to the long blues. Go over to prophase two. There are no homologous chromosomes in these daughter cells. I'm gonna make a note of that. So crossing over only occurs in prophase one. Oops. Okay, no homologous chromosomes. You have sister chromatids, but like I said before, there's no reason to have crossing over between identical sister chromatids. You'd be swapping the blue eye allele for the blue eye allele. Okay, now let's do metaphase two. Think of metaphase middle. Now we do have two daughter cells because we're in the second round of cell division. And let's draw the metaphase plate, the imaginary metaphase plate. Now, I find that as you are studying meiosis, it is really helpful 
to draw the process like numerous times. Okay. Now let me finish trying this. There we go. Okay. This should you should notice here that metaphase two looks different from metaphase one. And that is because during metaphase two, it is sister chromatids that line up in the middle of the cell. Okay, so during meiosis two, those sister chromatids are pulled apart, just as in mitosis. Meiosis one, it is homologous chromosomes that are separated, right? Each chromosome with two sister chromatids, but my metaphase two, you no longer have homologous chromosomes. It is the sister chromatids that are being pulled apart. So let's take a look. So here's metaphase two, the uh, sister chromatids are lined up right on that metaphase plate. Compare that to metaphase one. There are sister chromatids on top, sister chromatids on the bottom. The long reds are homologous to the long blues. Okay, so that is a major difference between metaphase one and two. Now we will go to anaphase two. Think of anaphase away. So during anaphase two, just as with mitosis, the sister chromatids are separated and pulled towards opposite poles of the cell. One daughter cell from meiosis one, here's the other daughter cell from meiosis one. So now it looks like this. Our long one and our short one. Now, once those sister chromatids are pulled apart, they are actually considered separate chromosomes again. There we go. I'll draw my spindle fibers here. Those are microtubules. And remember, in order for these sister chromatids to be pulled apart, the microtubule, microtubule spindle fibers have to shorten. And they do that by breaking down. Other cell and this. There we go. It's a little bit messy. Okay, our microtubule spindle fibers. Okay, so sister chromatids are separated during anaphase two. Now, finally, we have telophase two and cytokinesis. Remember the technical definition of cytokinesis is division of the cytoplasm. So the nuclear membranes reform around the chromosomes at opposite poles of the cell. I'm gonna put the microfilament creates the 
cleavage furrow. Now remember that this occurs along the metaphase plate, right? So where you see that metaphase plate is where the cell will divide in half. And then your um, chromosomes uncoil uh, and basically like they're not as dense after that. They go back to like this chromatin state. Here we have telophase two. Oh, I gotta make this smaller here. And, uh, these are my two daughter cells that have been going through meiosis two. So here we have, oh, whoops. So here we have one chromosome for pair number one, one chromosome for pair number two, right? No longer, we do not have homologous chromosomes. That is why these cells are haploid. Oh, I drew this wrong. Hold on one second. I apologize. Jumped ahead of myself. Wait a second. Uh -huh. Oh, I think I'm right. Hold on here. I have two. Okay. I know what I did wrong here. Okay. So here we have a long and a short. A long and a short. So this is telophase. We haven't actually squeezed the cells in half yet. Remember, we have two daughter cells because they already went through meiosis one, the first round of cell division. And then we would have a nucleus reform around these. So here's a nucleus, here's a nucleus, here's a nucleus, and here. Okay. Now, cytokinesis occurs. Write that down for you. Now, after cytokinesis, each of these daughter cells divides in half. So that is what gives you four haploid daughter cells. Now, remember, they're not smaller than the original. Just draw them that way. Okay. So now we have a long red. A short red, long red, short red, long blue, short blue, long blue, short blue. Okay, so these are haploid daughter cells and they form your gametes, egg or sperm. Okay, so your original parent cell would have had a long red, a long blue, a short red, a short blue. Goes through DNA replication and you end up with sister chromatids for each chromosome. So there would be like a long red X and a long blue X, a short red X, short blue X, right? That's after DNA replication. Meiosis one, you could get the long reds and the short reds in one cell, long blues, short blues in the other cell. Meiosis two, the sister chromatids are separated. So now you end up with one long red, one short red for two of the gametes, one long blue, one short blue for two of the gametes, okay? So meiosis goes from a diploid parent cell to four haploid daughter cells. Now these daughter cells are genetically unique because of crossing over and independent assortment of homologous chromosomes. So I'm going to write that here. OK, 
HIV. Daughter cells are genetically unique because of genetic recombination that occurs during prophase one with crossing over and metaphase one because of independent assortment of homologous chromosomes. Okay, so that is meiosis one and meiosis two. Remember the overall function of meiosis is to produce genetically unique haploid gametes for sexual reproduction. So in this PowerPoint, there was like, I think I put one slide in to show you uh, meiosis two, prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, telophase two, cytokinesis. So mitosis is similar to meiosis two because everything is happening to sister chromatids, just like mitosis. Okay. So your other learning objectives here are to look at the similarities and differences between mitosis and meiosis. So the one main similarity is that they both involve cell division, right? Parent cell divides, you get daughter cells. Now there are several differences between mitosis and meiosis that you need to know. So mitosis produces genetically identical daughter cells, a diploid parent to two diploid daughter cells, and they are identical, right? If you have skin cells and you need to repair a cut, you don't want like stomach cells put in there, right? You want skin cells. So mitosis makes genetically identical cells. Whereas meiosis, lost my cursor. figure out why I keep losing my cursor all the time. Okay, so meiosis produces genetically unique daughter cells. Mitosis results in diploid daughter cells. Meiosis results in haploid daughter cells. Mitosis, and this is not a super important point, but mitosis occurs throughout your lifetime, whereas meiosis takes place only at certain times in the organism's life cycle. And this mostly applies to females, right? A lot of meiosis occurs before we're born. So you're born with most of your eggs. Now mitosis can be used for asexual reproduction like in bacteria, whereas meiosis is used for sexual reproduction. Now keep in mind that most eukaryotes can undergo sexual reproduction with the exception of like some protists and things like that. But plants do sexual reproduction, fungi can do sexual reproduction, most of them, and animals can do sexual reproduction. Now, interestingly enough, there are some animals that can also do asexual reproduction, like um, Komodo dragons, right? Those huge lizards, they can reproduce asexually. Like a female can make offspring that are clones of herself without mating with a male. A lot of reptiles can do that. Fish can do that. So that's kind of an interesting thing about animals. Okay, so the only thing I wanna talk about with regards to a problem with meiosis is called non-disjunction. And non-disjunction basically means that the either the homologous chromosomes or the sister chromatids do not separate like they are supposed to during anaphase. So let's look at what happens there. So here is anaphase one. And notice that the homologous chromosomes are not separating. We call that non-disjunction. So let's go down and look here at the result. 
with non-disjunction during meiosis one, these are the gametes that you get. Now this says N plus one because it has an extra chromosome. Notice there are two chromosomes for pair number one. That means that, let's say this is a sperm, when it gets, it fertilizes an egg, and the egg donates a chromosome for chromosome pair one. Now there are three chromosomes when there should be two. Same with this gamete. Now the gametes that result from the other daughter cell that came from meiosis one, these are missing a chromosome. So these two gametes would have no chromosome for pair one. So when they got together with an egg, they're still missing a chromosome, right? They'd have the one chromosome that came from the egg, but there is no homologous chromosome. And this causes a variety of disorders. Now here, non-disjunction is occurring during meiosis two, anaphase two. Your sister chromatids are not separating like they should. So the result is, and I apologize, my little text box here is covering that. The result is one of the daughter cells after meiosis one, when it goes through meiosis two to make those gametes, one of the gametes has an extra chromosome right here. One of the gametes is missing a chromosome. And your other two gametes that came from the other daughter cell are okay. So I would argue maybe that non-disjunction during meiosis two is maybe not as bad as non-disjunction in meiosis one. So what does this do to the individual? Well, most of you are probably familiar with Down syndrome that is caused by trisomy 21. There's an extra chromosome for chromosome pair number 21. So that would be like an N plus one gamete, um, fertilizes with a regular gamete and you end up with an extra chromosome. Now notice that it's showing sister chromatids here. That's because we do a karyotype during metaphase. So it's after DNA replication and when those um, chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate. That's when we take this image. So trisomy 21 is an extra chromosome for pair 21. Now the other thing about non-disjunction, and I suspect that this has to do a lot with variability in gender. So we know now that we have like binary gender, male, female, but there's like a continuum of gender in between there, right? There are people who identify as neither gender or all kinds of different um, ways that people feel, right? So. What we're finding is a lot of this variation in gender comes from like non-disjunction that leads to different uh, numbers of sex chromosomes. For instance, there is a condition called Klinefelter syndrome, and I believe it's two X chromosomes and a Y. So if I remember correctly, the person develops male genitalia, but you have two X chromosomes that are influencing like hormone levels and um, like whether someone feels male or female. So Kleinfelter could be one way that you get a person with male genitalia, but that person does not identify as male. So what this is showing us, and there are so many different genetic factors in determining gender. But what this is showing us is that gender is genetically based, which we knew that, but we didn't know there was so much variation, right? And so for people who think that like uh, a person chooses not to be non-binary, hmm, I would argue that they don't choose, that it is genetically based, which is not to say it's good or bad, right? Um, well, I would argue it's not bad but uh, that it's not necessarily a choice, right? It comes down to genetics. So on that note, this was a very long recording, like I said, but that covers meiosis. So you need to know the stages of meiosis. I want you to know when genetic recombination occurs, prophase one, metaphase one. I would like you to know the differences between mitosis and meiosis and understand non-disjunction. So if you have any questions, please email me.